Father, we think of those that we have sung of in this wonderful hymn tonight. And as we sang it, we think of the tribes, the millions who are still without God and without hope. We sung about yonder sacred throng when you wind up all the affairs of this terrestrial ball on which we live, when you end all empires, industrial or the great empires of kings and rulers, and between here and there, there may be many tribulations and trials, but we thank you again that as you brought us so far, you'll take us further right to the end of the trail. Grant, Lord, this meeting which is not very large, but it's large enough to make an impact on this world if you get your way in every life tonight. We pray, Lord, for your glory, not for ours, not for the preacher, not even for last day's ministry, but we pray for your holy name's sake that you will invade this sanctuary tonight. We pray you'll work spiritual revolutions in us. We pray that some of us may go to our own funeral tonight and die to self and end all the failure and all the weakness and all that's been our handicap, all that's been our hang-up. Do work by the precious, precious blood of Jesus, the cleansing blood, the sanctifying blood, the blood of the everlasting covenant. Again, we ask in honesty, we ask with desire that this will be a very, very bad night for the devil. We pray that lives here where he's had dominion, that that dominion will be broken. Where he's been deceptive, that he'll be unmasked tonight. Where he's tried to make us fearful and intimidate us. Oh, give us a revelation of your glory and your power. We pray that the very angels in heaven may have a good time tonight, rejoicing over all bondage that shall cease. Take the veil away from your word. Take the veil away from our understanding. Open the word, open our minds, and then open our mouths to tell what great things God has done. As we think of the millions again tonight, some of them lying, as we saw in the newspaper recently, lying with their bones bleaching, haven't strength to stand up, in areas of Africa, other areas, Lord, where there's a total dissolution of their lifestyle, and other areas where there's prosperity, and yet they're without God and without hope. Father, again, save us from being earthly-minded. Let the things of earth grow strangely dim. They look strangely grim when we get into eternity. We look back and see how often the devil fooled us and how often our own flesh fooled us and how often we were unwilling and undeserving and we gave up when we should have gone on. Change our thinking tonight. Change our desires. Change our aspirations. Make us captives. As an old saint said in England years ago, make me a captive, Lord, and then I shall be free. Force me to render up my sword, and I shall conquer be. I sink in, wild, in, in life's alarms when by myself I stand. Imprison me within thine arms, and strong it shall be my hand. O oh God, we bless you that you're more adequate than we can ever dream of. I think, Lord, when we get to eternity, some of us have lived many years, but if you were to cut us all off tonight and sweep us into eternity, we'd discover that we're only in spiritual water to our ankles, not to our knees, not to our loins. We're still paddling on the edge of the ocean of the possibilities of grace. Put a holy dissatisfaction in us tonight, and then holy desires. Our supreme desire is that from this meeting Jesus shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. We give you praise in his name. Before you sit down, let's sing number one. This is, if you have Keith's record, you remember he recorded this not long, 
before he went into the presence of the king. It was a favorite. We used to sing it almost every Friday night. <clears throat> Number one, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. text tonight which is a question and it's a question that we cannot answer collectively it's a question you have to answer individually it's found in the very practical epistle as it's usually called the epistle of James in the fourth chapter and verse 14 maybe we should read from verse 13 Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such and such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time, and then it vanisheth away. 
Can you think, can you think of something that was on earth before Adam was here? And it was removed and it's in heaven now. And uh, it may come back to earth. I thought you were waving a lady putting a sweater on. <coughs> well, the tree of life. Oh, did you, were you raising your hand? I can't see very well. The tree of life was there before Adam went into the garden. And now we're told the tree of life is in the, the other garden, the paradise of God. And you know, this is about the most fascinating study that there is, and you will never face a more challenging question than this text. What is your life? Now notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say what is life, because if it did, nobody has an answer. It doesn't say what is our life, otherwise we could pool all our thinking. It says what is your life? And it replies, uh, gives a reply here in the text, it is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time. There are three main questions that come up in life. Children ask this question, where did I come from? And somewhere, sometime, you better give them the right answer, because if you don't, somebody will give them the wrong answer. And then maybe at your age right now, you're asking another question, why am I here? And then when you get further up the road, which I happen to be, uh, you say, where do I go from here? So there are three basic questions about life. Where, where did it come from? Why am I here? And where do I go from here? I was thinking of what the different poets have said about this. One of them said this, life at its best is very brief. Like the falling of a leaf, like the binding of a sheaf, be in time. Francis Henry Light, he lived in Ireland near where we used to live a long while before we were there. And there's a big memorial to him in the Royal Pretoria School that my boys went to. Francis Henry Light wrote this great hymn, Abide With Me. And in that hymn, you may recall, he says this, Swift to its close ebbs out life's little day. Uh, another poet says, The lives of great men should remind us that we all may be sublime and departing leave behind us footprints in the sands of time. Another one says about great men that, uh, how did he put it? Uh, life is fleeting, life is earnest, and the grave is not the goal. Dust thou art to dust returnest was not spoken of as the soul. Now, if this book is about anything at all, it's about life. I was looking while I was away this past weekend at a fairly recent issue of National Geographic. And uh, it certainly has some fantastic photography. Part of it was about Somaliland. And there were women there lying on the floor with a bit of a rag around them. Their ribs were standing out. And there were corpses of babies all over the place. And the country right now is in a terrible grip of famine. And while we today couldn't make up our minds what kind of ice cream we like, I mean, you know, we've got 28 varieties, but surely there must be another one. And 48 different types of, um, what do you call the things with a hole in the middle? Donuts? There must be some other kind of uh, thing to eat besides donuts. And you hear people say, well, life isn't just, life isn't fair. One man said, life is a feast. Another wise man said, life is a fast. One man said, life is a paradise. Another man says, life is a prison. You see, the question here is very pointed, and maybe it's very personal. It is impersonal, maybe it's very painful. Maybe you could answer the question, what is your life? You say, it's a failure. What is your life? A success. What is your life? It's a disappointment. But actually, it's showing to us, by the very context, 
that, that life is like a vapor. It's like the steam that comes off the kettle and you try and get a handful of it and it's gone. And in every case in the Word of God where life is referred to, that is this physical life, it's likened to something that's very swift. It's like, a, like in, for instance, to a weaver's shuttle. It's like, likened to a tent that men wrap up and move on in the night. Isaiah likens our life to the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven. Now, you know, there's a saying that's, that, that, that it, it becomes almost facetious to say, but it's said amongst many Christians, uh, only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for God will last. But that's exactly what the poet did not say. What the poet said, only one life, to will soon be passed, and only what's done for God will last. And when I am dying, how glad I shall be if the lamp of my life has been burned out for thee. As I said tonight, it's, again, it's easy, easy to say uh, the things of earth uh, will grow strangely dim. You, you, you feel very pious when you say that. But you know, when you get to eternity and look back, the things of earth will look very grim. We'll possibly discover we've been as earthly minded as the reprobates outside who are dancing and lusting tonight. Oh, we're trying to put Humpty Dumpty together again, you know. I used to ask what that was about when I was a little boy. I never found an answer to it. Oh, you can get an illustrated uh, book of nursery rhymes and Humpty Dumpty is a, uh, an egg on a wall and he falls off and breaks himself into a hundred pieces and all the king's horses and all the king's men can't put Humpty Dumpty together again. Or the old argument, anybody can scramble eggs, who can unscramble them? Life, men have been trying to manage it, direct it. They've kind of considered that if you made the environment better,